solve it. Who would like to start? Oh no, but you don't have to bring turn. <laughs> okay, Cheryl, you win. Yep. I nominate Cheryl. Oh, all right. Well, just tell me when to stop so I can talk to myself. <laughs> um, so, hi. My name is Cheryl Kreger, and let's see, I graduated in 1990 from St. Ben, so half the buildings on campus did not exist when I was here. Just to put it in perspective, the library was the new building when I was here. So, um, and I was a history major. I had no minor. I kind of joke I was the poster child for liberal arts. I took whatever I wanted. And oddly enough, I could have graduated a semester early without planning. Um, so my last semester, I interned with United Way in St. Cloud. After graduation, I I should clarify, I'm not an attorney. Um, so <laughs> I worked with people with disabilities in residential vocational settings. I always wanted to volunteer, so I volunteered for a year at a homeless shelter in Southern Colorado. That's when I wanted to change the world and then learn that you can't when you're 22. Um, I Let's see, after that I came back to St. Cloud and I worked for the Volunteer Center in United Way again. So where I interned, I ended up working there as an adult later on, which was great. And then I realized that career-wise I wasn't going to go anywhere because um, I had my bachelor's, but I really wanted to be a director, move up in the nonprofit world, and so I quit my job went back to school and got my master's from the Humphrey Institute at the University of Minnesota um, in public affairs. They changed their names. I don't actually remember what they're called now. And I got a master's in nonprofit public management and healthcare policy. While I was there, I was a public policy fellow with the Minnesota Council Nonprofit. So I learned about lobbying and advocacy from the nonprofit standpoint. I also did contract work with the Department of Ed, working with the AmeriCorps program, actually worked in some of their grants and recruiting new sites did some board management, that kind of thing. And then I married my husband, and he decided to go back into the active duty Navy. So I ended up on a Marine base in North Carolina afterwards. And the interesting thing is I protested at the Pentagon when I was an undergrad. I protested against ROTC. I, <laughs> and I ended up marrying someone in the military and got married at Fort Snelling in a military chapel. So my friends thought I was insane. So, <laughs> um, so our life takes us in very different places. Um, in North Carolina, I became a director of a Big Brothers and Big Sisters organization. I supervised six counties, staff serving six different counties in a very poor rural area, so it was really tough to find money to find mentors for kids in that area. I learned a tremendous amount. I also learned that there was a lot I didn't like. Um, I hated HR, so I'm glad someone does it because I didn't like it. Um, but it was a really good experience, and then I had my daughter there. I moved to Guam after that for two years. I stayed at home mom, had my son there, and then we moved to Rhode Island. So I was there for about a year and a half, and I did some work with Kids Count doing data and research and discovered I was really bad at it. Didn't like it. See, I'm telling you about all about the things you don't hear about, kind of the job failures, but I think it's good to know because you need to learn what you like and what you don't when you go through life and careers. Um, and then I moved back to Minnesota about five years ago. My husband got out of active duty military. And I knew I didn't want to be a director again of a nonprofit, but I still wanted to stay in that world because I still have that kind of want to save the world part of my life. And I have two kids, so I didn't want to be a director again because it's a lot of work, a lot of hours. And so I ended up getting my job with the organization I work for now. I started as a project manager, and the group I worked for, it started out as the Juvenile Justice Committee of Hennepin County. And so our goal was, how do we make the juvenile justice system better for kids in Hennepin County? in the state. And uh, my first task, my first, literally my first day on the job, I was told to map the juvenile justice system out in Hennepin County. That was the only direction I got. I was like, okay, I think I can do this. So I spent nine months interviewing folks and I basically came up with this series of flow charts on how the system works, all the multiple systems involved in juvenile justice, put together some reports, did a lot of presentations on it. Um, met with attorneys, judges, corrections officers, law enforcement, so I learned a lot about the system. And for those, so if you're interested in going into legal or criminal justice system, one of the things I tell people when I do presentations is, let's face it, unless you got in trouble yourself or someone you know, or you watch TV and that's not realistic, you don't really know what it's like. I mean, in juvenile justice especially, the only show on TV was Judging Amy, and I can tell you it's not like that. You know, and so it's a system that's very complex. It's 
multiple groups coming together, um, and quite honestly, it's not really the best for kids, it's not the best for families, and it's not the best for victims. So what we do is try to make it better for everybody in a state system that's county-based. Um, so in 2008, we held a statewide forum, we brought in national experts, we um, had local folks come and highlight things happening here in Minnesota. And out of that forum, it became clear from folks that they wanted a state group to look at juvenile justice. So we literally, my coworker and I, got rid of our existing steering committee, which was Hennepin County, and fired them, and recruited people to form a statewide organization around juvenile justice. And about a little over a year ago, I became the director of that organization. And so I'm doing fundraising, which I didn't want to do. <laughs> I'm now director of a nonprofit again, which I didn't necessarily want to do. Um, I work more than 40 hours. But what I do is really try to make the system better for kids. And that keeps me going, and that's what I'm really passionate about. Um, St. Ben, St. John's really teaches you about social justice. And for me, what this allows me to do is keep that going in my life. Um, and so our juvenile justice system in Minnesota is one of the best in the country, and it's still not good for kids. Um, and so I think why Mary Harlan DeLock asked me to come today is because I serve kind of the advocacy role. I'm not an attorney. I wish I was, especially this morning. Um, but what we do is we try to advocate to make the system better. And so I work with people who work in the system. I work with attorneys, law enforcement, corrections, adv other advocates, work with kids, work with parents. Um, my day-to-day -day job is different. Every day I do something different. I facilitate work groups around the state on how do we keep kids out of the system, how do we make it better. I've developed guidebooks on diversion, keeping kids out of the system, on aftercare. I'm in the process of writing a guidebook on for our delinquency court system so judges and attorneys, they don't get any training on working with juveniles, and so we're trying to put together a guidebook for them to help them so that when a kid comes in front of you in court, you know that they're a young person and not an adult. And there are differences between young people and adults. And so we need to treat them like that. Um, right now, our system tends to criminalize kids. When I was in school, you didn't get sent to the court if you got in a fight. Now, young people are getting charged with felonies and assault. And if you get a felony, it stays with you for the rest of your life, even if you're a juvenile. So that's some of the things that I do. Um, I do the grant writing. I work with our board. We're not technically a nonprofit. Um, our other project we're working on, and I'm the co a lead on it, is we're partnering with Georgetown University and a funder out of Seattle on helping put together a project here in Minnesota in five counties so kids involved in both child protection and delinquency they can get involved in both, and we're trying to prevent that and get better outcomes. So I work with five counties in the state, state agencies, and lead this project and try to put that in place here in Minnesota. And then the other parts that we're trying to do is work with communities around the state on putting in best practices around diversion, keeping kids out of the system. So I do the lead on that. And then we're also just decided yesterday to start focusing efforts in the school to prison pipeline to keep kids out of the system, out of criminal schools, which disproportionately affects young males, um, especially African-American males. So just to give you an idea, in Minneapolis school system, African Americans make up 35% of their school population. 75% of their suspensions are African American males. Uh, so that's kind of what I do. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I am Jennifer Elston Brondell, and I am a practicing attorney here in St. Cloud. Um, I work for Rinky Noonan Law Firm here, and um, have been there for since. Oh, July, so about, I guess, eight or nine months. And before that, I was with another law firm in the area, and actually in Cold Spring. And I was there for five years prior to uh, joining Rinky Noonan. So um, I graduated from St. Ben's in 1999, and I graduated with a, a degree in psychology. And had no idea at that point that I would end up going to law school. Hadn't really thought that that was the path I was going to take at that point. But... Um, Ended up working after law, after undergraduate at a residential treatment center for uh, chemically dependent and uh, and um, emotionally and behavioral uh, d issues uh, with adolescents. So um, they lived there, and uh, we did counseling and uh, just tried to help keep them out of trouble. 
Um, a lot of them were court ordered there. And so that was really my first exposure with the legal system is seeing how they were struggling with their uh, probation officers and their social workers and everything else that they were going through in addition to uh, a lot of the other emotional and chemical dependency issues that they had. And so that's when I first started to think maybe I wanted to go to law school in, in the criminal areas where I thought I would end up. Um, and uh, ended up after that doing a series of odd jobs, to, <laughs> you know, things that you never planned on doing, you know, kind of the boring uh, cube job insurance and that type of thing. And decided that I wanted to go back to school and uh, was either go back and get uh, my master's in uh, counseling or uh, going to law school. So I decided to go to law school. And while I was there, I started taking some classes in estate tax and uh, estate planning and um, really enjoyed those areas of, of law more than I anticipated. It sounded really boring. And then I went to the classes and found out there was a there was a lot of interesting things about it that I enjoyed um, and tended more towards that route. Um, when I graduated from law school, I moved back up in this area and took a job in Cold Spring where I started doing transactional work there. So real estate, estate planning, um, contract work, and business and corporations, and uh, man wealth management through estate planning. And then uh, now I'm in a large firm where I get to focus pretty much exclusively on estate planning, but I do get, uh, I get to see some court time uh, doing probate work and some trust in estate litigation. So I didn't totally avoid that piece, but it's fun to get that uh, as a change of pace from, from the day-to-day -day, uh, document preparation and meeting with clients that I do. Um, and my typical day is uh, usually meet with clients. So I usually have quite a few client appointments, uh, talking with clients about what their goals are and what issues they have. And it actually gets pretty interesting and pretty exciting because we get to hear all the family dynamics and, and juicy details about why people are being written out of the estate or why they don't want somebody's wife to be included and things like that. So we get to hear a lot about uh, family dynamics. But um, And then usually, usually some drafting time during the day to prepare documents for clients or review drafts that paralegals have prepared. And... Um, Lots of telephone time talking with clients and, <clears throat> like I say, occasionally some courtroom time going and uh, if there's a, if I do a probate, which is the administration of, of the will through the court system, I end up happening to make an appearance occasionally for those. Um, and I also do guardianship and conservatorship work for persons that need uh, someone appointed to manage their uh, health or financial needs that because they're incapacitated. So get to do some uh, courtroom appearances for those as well. Uh, and uh, working in a big firm is fun because you get to hear a lot more of, about what other litigators are doing and other people in the office are doing, but um, a, lot more, a lot more people to talk with and bounce ideas off of. Uh, that's pretty much what I do in a nutshell. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, first of all, I think, you know, being part of this panel is uh, great to have this invite and be here, whether there's one or 50 people in the room, I think it's pretty quaint. Um, my roadmap's pretty colorful. Um, I think just like the ladies on the board here is that my current position is manager of Caribou Coffee. And what does that mean? No, I don't just protect the bean. I don't just <laughs> count beans. I actually oversee all safety and security procedures for 550 plus stores. Uh, we're in the corporate office out of uh, Brooklyn Center, 694 and 100. So if you get down there, I also have a business card to pass out. But how did I get there? Uh, 1998, um, political science major with a German minor. My uh, dream was to be an international attorney. Don't think so. <laughs> and I think with that, when I went to school, it was either pre-law or pre-gov or public policy. And there wasn't a lot of flexibility there. And so... Um, during my course of education, I did four internships, and I can only recommend that um, to anyone and everyone to do an internship, paid or unpaid. All mine were unpaid, and um, my first job out of college was one of those internships turned into an opportunity as an employer, and I worked as a law clerk for a judge in Ramsey County who's now a family friend, a mentor, and I've stuck in contact with him for the years doing many other things. I did a year at William Mitchell Law School, and then I found that, you know, it just wasn't for me, and so I took a year off, and I I went back to a master's program at St. Catharines for organizational leadership. 
During that time, um, I was still clerking for uh, the judge, and I also volunteered in the DWI unit. I worked at a women's correctional facility, so anyone doing a year or less, um, I managed, or anyone doing a halfway house time, so anyone in, coming out of prison a year and a day or more spent their time there as well. Uh, during that time, I found that that probably wasn't something that I want to continue in. Obviously, coming out of school, you have loans, therefore having two, three jobs wasn't, wasn't something uncommon, but I wanted to stay with kind of what I consider now my criminal justice profession. And when I finished, I decided to go into retail security. So I started working for Target Corporation from 2000 to 2004. And I was born and raised in Minnesota, but I left Minnesota and I worked in Dallas for a couple years during, I moved four, I moved down to Dallas four days after 9-11. So it was very interesting. Um, we had the anthrax scares. We had many things going on and, you know, it's Twin Cities down to DFW, which is uh, similar as well, only things are bigger and bigger and bolder down there. Um, so I worked in the private industry for about four years, and then there was an opportunity that presented itself at Caribou Coffee Company. I won't hold it against you if you drink Starbucks or Dump Brothers, but Caribou is a Minnesota-grown company. Um, but I actually was the second person on in that company for the department. It's the loss prevention department, so I've been there eight years now, and like like I said, I oversee all of the investigations, guest, team member, um, any type of law enforcement related partnerships, court, anything and everything that deals with safety, security, protecting you as the guest, protecting employees. That's my job. And um, we are in 18 states. We have 550 stores if you could include the franchise overseas. A lot of what I do at Caribou, like these ladies said, it's different every single day. Um, you know, do I sit in my plush corporate office? Absolutely not. Today I was going to a store in St. Paul burning video of a, pur uh, a purse theft. Uh, robberies, burglaries, indecent exposure, drug paraphernalia, um, you name it, we have it, whether it's Caribou Coffee, selling a great cup of coffee, or working at Target Corporation. Um, during my time at Caribou Coffee, I've given a lot of opportunity. Um, I'm AAA espresso without the espresso kind of uh, personality, so I get a chance to also teach as an adjunct professor to a criminal justice class at ITT Tech. I also conduct my own um, television show with uh, my old boss, who's a judge, criminal justice-related topics. And I also sit as the president for the Minnesota Crime Prevention Association, which is made up of roughly 300 members of the Crime Prevention um, Association pro law enforcement department. So, you know, it's an exciting, it's an exciting group. Um, it's fun to be part of that. I get a chance to go to colleges and universities to talk about loss prevention, physical security, and then also kind of get into those speaking engagements where students get a chance to not only job shadow, do informational interviews, um, conduct internships at, at Caribou Coffee, actually, in our department. Um, I think what's, what's really exciting is that when we talk about, you know, what we do in criminal justice is that, you know, I wanted to round out my education by going back to Concordia St. Paul. And I finished out with my master's in criminal justice leadership about a year and a half ago in their program. So it's been a wild ride. It's been fun. Um, there's a lot to be said for the wide variety that you have up here. Obviously, quite a variety of professional and personal experiences. And I think typically, in most cases, that this is a great opportunity for you guys to ask any questions, anything that's not on the table, on the table, that's taboo. Um, I think what I can tell you guys most importantly is that um, dig in, dig in and get your feet in to something that, you know, piques your interest and then, you know, um, deciding where it goes from there. It's all about the networking. You know, it's it's the old adage of what you know or who you know gets the job and what you know, you know, puts you into that place. But nowadays it's all about, it's really all about the networking. Um, so I'm going to close with that, Ed, and see if there's where you'd like us to go from here. I think from my experience, it's it's good to try to get into the legal profession, but I don't think that it certainly isn't going to be necessary. You're going to be spending a lot of time studying for the LSAT and uh, pre preparing for that. So just having a job that you can manage along with your you know studying schedule and preparation is really going to be key, whether it's in the legal field or not. 
um, certainly the more exposure you get to legal related topics and that type of information, the, the, the more benefit you have on the LSAT because you have exposure to things that you may not otherwise hear about at work or get a chance to talk with people about at work where if you're in a law office or some other legal setting, you might hear, you know, things talked about and get some exposure that you wouldn't otherwise have. But um, I, I think from, from my perspective, it's time management as far as being able to prepare for the LSAT and, um, and, and continue your job and be able to, you know, support yourself as much as you can. The other thing that I would suggest... Um, Right now, I'm actually a mentor to a student from St. Ben's. She's um, graduated a couple years ago from law school. And one of the things that I keep asking her is, what does she want to do with her law? You know, she's a lawyer. She passed the bar and stuff. And so the other thing is, I would you know, think about what you want to do when you're done with law school. And if there's, you know, some experiences you can get or exposure now that will kind of help you when you get done. But the other thing is, you could also just volunteer from some, some of the, like, the legal rights centers or legal aid centers you know, as a non-attorney to get some exposure as well and some experience, you know, without having to, you know, mm -hmm. you know, get you some of that while you maybe do that job that may not be in the legal field. That's the other way to do it. So. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt to look at the court systems like these ladies um, had mentioned as far as do you need something in the legal field? You're absolutely right. No. Um, I think when I, my internship, which then keeping in contact with people is called a bailiff law clerk. And those are folks that don't have their law degree, and then it can turn into a judicial law clerk. But anything that you can do to maintain contact, have gainful employment of some kind, <laughs> I mean, that's the biggest thing. I mean, you know, the time management piece, the organization piece, but it's having some type of income coming in is going to help to lessen some type of stress, too. Jennifer, working in a large law firm, what are some of the different areas that your colleagues are involved in? Oh boy, um, we get a there's about uh, 26 of us that work in my firm, so um, we get a little bit of everything. We have attorneys that do uh, government work and represent some of the smaller cities around us uh, and some of the other counties around here. Um, we have attorneys that do divorce, uh, marital termination agreements, uh, dissolutions, that type of work. Um, there's, uh, a, we have a whole corporate department. They do incorporations and represent businesses and employee, employment matters, um, you know, employee disputes with the, the, their boss and terminations and that type of thing. Um, we have a, a whole series of three or four attorneys that specialize in drainage and ditch law, which um, is, so sound, I'm not really even sure what that is. I know it has to do with water and that they're really busy going out and visiting sites where, uh, they are, I, I suppose, someone's water is draining on someone else's property, that type of thing. Or there's, a, you know, the government, I, or the city, I suppose, needs to take the property for drainage purposes. Um, we have another attorney that does uh, real estate work, and um, he's an examiner of titles for some of the counties around here. Um, so he, his job involves examining um, real estate and the, the succession of ownership in real estate matters and also helping people prepare real estate documents, purchase agreements, deeds, and that type of thing. Um, we have, uh, I, those are the main things that I can think of offhand. Of course, we have lit litigators who do a variety of criminal work, and um, that they're, they're, they spend a lot more time in the courtroom, of course, than I do, doing a lot more um, as far as um, court appearances and hearings and uh, their clients aren't always there voluntarily. Sometimes they're there because they, they have had some legal issues. But um, uh, we get a little bit of everything, I think. And if I could add to uh, Jennifer's comment is that, too, it's good when you're looking into law school and even what you had said is that look to what you want to do after, is that most major corporations have a general counsel, and that is their in-house attorney, um, Caribou Coffee, or attorneys. Caribou Coffee used to uh, market out for some of that work, but we, we have our general counsel in-house. That person is there to represent Caribou Coffee in any type of litigation, any type of court settlements, uh, general liability claims, work comp claims, um, came from Carlson Company, uh, worked at MoneyGram. So those are some pretty fruitful jobs, too, that I think um, even when I was in school, you know, looking for the law firm job, the documentation clerk job, while that's there and that's that's fruitful, too, there's a lot of places that, you know, having a law degree or being an attorney as a J, you know, JD and having that degree, you can go. So 
Absolutely. I think that one thing that, uh, you know, is is a difficult thing about being a practicing attorney is the billable hours. You have to, you, you hear a lot about that. It's how much time you have to spend uh, billing clients and lots of firms have billable hour requirements that how many minimum uh, billable hours you have to make per year, per month uh, in order to maintain your position and work towards partnership. Uh, the benefit of not working in a, you know, in a law firm is that you don't have to work, worry about billable hours. You can do your job, and typically when your work is done, you're, you, you can go, you're, you're done for the day. You don't have to worry about, about meeting those minimum requirements. So um, I've had the benefit of, of working in two different firms, one that did have them and one that uh, does. And I can tell you that happening to watch the clock and keep track of those billable hours is not not the funnest part of the job, but certainly uh, rewarding when you do meet them, I suppose. But you know, I would, the other thing I would say is I know quite a few of attorneys that are advocates around the country in trying to make the system better. And for way they certainly don't have billable hours. <laughs> so, I'm not sure how they pay back their law degree, but um, <laughs> there are a lot of positions around the country, especially nationally and in D.C., where um, attorneys work, um, advocates trying to make the system better, representing young people or adults um, who maybe did not get a fair shake with the system. Um, Last week, there were attorneys representing young people who, um, with the Supreme Court, with one of their cases looking at, um, we, this is the advocacy part of me, but um, there are 2,000 children in Minnesota, or in the country, who are sentenced to life without parole, to prison, to adult prison, and so there was a case heard last week in the Supreme Court to try to rule if kids younger than 14, if it's unconstitutional and cruel and unusual punishment for them to be held in prison for the rest of their life, but so there are ways for attorneys to do things besides corporate or things. Um, and I, there are times where I wish I had that degree so I could do some of that. So you don't make as much money, I guarantee. <laughs> but, you know, you do get to do some other things. So I think that helps. You know, I actually would like to pull that question a little bit more on academic law advisors. And that's one of the challenges we're dealing with in working with this time is many are the these sort of law firms and in the law profession. Uh, the New York Times a year ago had this big article on uh, what year in the law firm was happy. You know, I remember this in the system on this technology of death and uh, sort of outsourcing of like major work in the uh, country. But I think it was really bleak. I mean, we have to say bleak, but from various backgrounds and some of these. Uh, have, have dabbled in the law and then pursued the bureaucracy. And I think these are really sweet people. So these are your sort of decision points being made. Like, yes, I can do my own law school and I'm going to commit myself to this. I know that people don't want to go to law school. I, I see a graduate degree or some other work experience that's more valuable than a good paying job. So that's a question I have you know, as a senior senior as you get to that point. And it's really an important point to be made about really exploring what you want to do in your life because if you give yourself a lot of guarantees and then you get success. Yeah, sure. You know, I think there's perception, there's reality. And if you perceive it, it is real. And I think one of the biggest things for me is that after my first year of law school, it wasn't that I didn't want to continue, but I was a realist. It's a lot of money. And I was just coming out of undergrad and I don't like debt. And to see all the people that were in those top percentages graduating with no jobs, it's bleak. It, it, it is what it is. But I think where I come from and knowing the wide variety of background I have is people need to understand, especially undergrad students, that there's so much more out there than just law and government. Um, they do go hand in hand. And that's why even talking to my students at ITT, they're in their AA program and it's it's bleak for them too. It, it's tough. And I think that's where people need to come in and understand you're going to have to put in your time. You're going to have to be realistic. Uh, having your four-year degree, and this is just my opinion, um, having a four-year degree, that's great. There are a dime a dozen. And I think that people need to understand that there's opportunities above and beyond that, whether it's a JD, whether it's an MBA, whether it's a master's. And it's not a scary thing. It's just truly what's out there. You have to be more competitive than the next person, just like the old resume. What does it look like? And I actually do coaching and training on resumes to say that, you know what, talk to the people you made contacts with. I pass out business cards for a reason because if there's an opening and I've talked with you and you want to come in for an informational interview, I'll probably put my stamp on you before someone else. 
Um, it's all about keeping your connections. And I think for me, law school is a great opportunity. I learned a lot in a short period of time. Um, but I also know what happened to some of my peers and some got jobs, some are motivated, some are not. It will not come and find you. You have to find it. And I think that's probably what's really important, but you're in a really great field. It's one of those that are growing. And I say criminal justice because mine was political science and it was government before that. They changed the degree name. Um, but you're in a very growing field. But I think people need to understand that there's so much out there for the taking that's beyond just the law or beyond the government piece, private security, private industries, public industries. I mean, I have so many kids right now that want to be police officers. That's bleak. Um, and I think that, you know, if people want to be honest about it, then I think that gives people a better opportunity to look look elsewhere or shop maybe in a different aisle for the time being. So, I think from my experience, it's been um, somewhat true to the extent that if you're not the top of your class, you don't have your pick of the job. Um, but um, I think that you have to be realistic and realize that there are a lot of jobs out there that may not be at the biggest firm in downtown Minneapolis that are still satisfying and that you still enjoy. Um, it is a big commitment financially, and um, you have to be prepared for that, whether you're willing to take on that type of uh, debt and uh, whether or not you're willing to take on that time commitment because it is a lot of work. Um, but it, in the end, I, I really do enjoy what I do, so I, I feel like my it was worth it to me to do it, and I was lucky enough to get a job right away, and I was in a, in a probably a somewhat better job market, but, um, you know... It, I also wasn't seeking the, the big, highly competitive jobs for the bigger firms in, you know, the cities or things like that. I was looking at smaller communities and smaller firms and uh, have now kind of worked my way into a larger firm in this area, um, which is great. But I didn't have that expectation of going in and getting the, the top job and making partner in three years and making, you know, the hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, that, that is not, that's not what's <laughs> happening here. Those are the movies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I graduated from law school with a lot of debt and I will be paying it off probably until I retire. And I, uh, but I enjoy what I do. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I it's been a great experience. I mean, one of the things that I, I mean, I didn't go to law school. I had no desire, actually, to ever go to law school. Um, but I did get my master's. But I will say I worked for, I want to say, almost 10 years mm -hmm. before I went back to school. And I can honestly say that that put me in a better place. I would have gotten an advanced degree in a completely different subject. I probably would have gotten a history master's in law <laughs> that would have been even more useless. <laughs> I mean, not that I don't love history and it's great, but, you know, I mean, so, I mean, one of the things that I would, you know, also encourage you to do, I mean, I think it's actually great to take a year off or longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was in my master's program, the individuals who went straight from undergrad to master's, very different viewpoint, very mm -hmm. different perspective on how they treated that program versus those of us who had worked before. And I think it gives you a perspective that you don't get when you just go right through school. Um, you know, so, and it also gives you a chance to really think more about what it is you want to do and what is the best route for you to go. Is it a master's degree in some subject or is it law school? Um, I think it's okay to, you know, give yourself that time to think about it and not have to jump right in because it is a lot of money. You know, um, even a master's degree is a lot of money. Um, I was fortunate, and then I married my husband, and he helped me pay it back. So, you know, <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend that, but it's just the way my life turned out. Um, you know, so, I mean, I think you really have to think about it. The other thing is, if you listen to our stories, none of us started, we didn't end up where we thought we would. None of my friends did that I went to school here at St. Ben, St. John's with. We all ended up in different places than we thought we would. Mm -hmm. And I know when you're 20, 21, 22, you think you have to have it all figured out, and you don't. Um, you know, and give yourself that freedom to kind of have that, you know, think about it. I don't have to know what I want to do. I still don't know what I want to do, quite honestly. <laughs> I happen to get this job. I'm in this position, you know, and it's great. But, you know, quite honestly, I'm trying to think of the next part in my life after this. You know, so, I mean, I think that's the other piece of it is make sure it's the right decision for you at the right time in your life. And it's okay to wait. And I agree with the networking. I think half the jobs I've had, it's because I've met people. And when you um, move around a lot like I did, I physically forced myself to do informational interviews. And I would call up St. Ben's and where I went to my master's, the career services, get to know those folks, get to know Ed and Mary, and stay friends with them. 
guarantee it's the best thing you can do because what they can do is wherever you end up, they can get you connected with alums mm -hmm. from St. Ben to St. John's, and then you have an in, and you can set up the informational interviews wherever you end up, and you start getting to know people, and you start making those broader connections, and that has really, for me, that has been the best thing. And they look at my resume, and they help me as I've gone through my career. My resume has changed, my life has changed, and they've helped me re-look at it from when I was 22 to where I'm at now. I mean, I'm not going to tell you my age. So. <laughs> <laughs> 22. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, I mean, that's the part that I would just think about. One thing I just wanted to add is that I would encourage you, if you want to do it at our office or somewhere else, to shadow an attorney for a day if you think, if you haven't already, if it's something that you really think you're interested in as far as, you know, being a practicing attorney versus some of the other. There's lots and lots. When you go, when I went to law school, one of the first things we got in our um, in orientation was 101 things that you can do with a law degree. There's a lot of different things that you can do. You don't have to just be a practicing attorney. But um, if you do think that's the route you want to go, I, I would encourage you to spend a day or a couple of days uh, shadowing an attorney and seeing if it really is everything that you think that it is before you make the commitment to do that. <clears throat> Jennifer, who are people you interact with on a day-in, day-out basis? I mean, loss prevention and care of the <laughs> I know Kush, right? You know, it sounds, it sounds <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, what's interesting is that kind of a little bit of back history is that Caribou Coffee, whenever there was maybe a theft or fraud related matter, team member or guest, they would hire private investigators. Okay. But if you're paying someone $50 an hour to investigate $200 in loss, you're really not getting your best return on investment. So what they decided to do, like many companies that have more of an infancy loss prevention, assets protection, risks management, whatever may be the term, they bring it in-house. And that's where I came aboard with uh, my supervisor who used to actually work 15 years at Target in security. And, um, you know, my job is really all about writing policies, procedures, I interact with vice presidents, the CEO, CFO of the company. I deal with 6,500 employees probably on a daily basis as needed. Um, you know, 415 store managers, probably 60 field district managers. Um, I also deal with employee relations. So I investigate people. I interview people for theft and fraud. I do not terminate. I highly suggest termination when it comes to my department. Um, like they, I tell them, I said, I'm not the three-headed monster, but boy, when they know LP's coming, boy, you better move out of the way, which is kind of good. Um, I deal with law enforcement. I deal with judges, juries, um, public defenders, prosecutors. So what's neat about what I do and in the private industry, I get to do all that fun stuff. I work on task force, dealing with burglaries, robberies. And this isn't just Caribou Coffee. This is also other retailers, Walmarts, Targets, Brinker International, which has um, different restaurants, quick service restaurants. So it's it's the glitz and glamour in a different type of setting. And um Many of the people that I work with are my local police officers, my investigators, my sergeants. And what's really neat is I get to work with many people, and that's where you start to connect the dots. If anything, I say I'm a conduit of information. So if I'm going to work on a task force um, regarding some burglaries we had, I'm going to now then get a chance to meet a DEA agent, an FBI agent. Um, where that goes from there, you never know. What's really neat is when you start to peel back the onion and check the layers, there's so many things out there that she mentioned volunteer work, paid or unpaid, phenomenal. When I was working at Target, I decided I don't want to be a police officer, but there are citizen police academies you can go to. Now, why do you want to go? Well, you get to meet people that have influence. They could have opportunities down the road. It's just like I just recently met the FBI agent for Minnesota North Dakota, South Dakota. Well, interesting, they have an FBI Citizens Academy. I'm on the roster to start. So where that goes, you never know. And that's why is that, you know, take the horse blinders off and look at all those opportunities. To your point, Ed, is who do I deal with? I deal with anyone and everyone that has interconnection, attorneys, unemployment, um, here at administrative law judges. So wide variety, because that's the position that I'm in, is to deal with the store operations, the vice presidents, making sure that I deal with protection, 
terminating people, walking people. There's a lot of that stuff that because of the education and background and because we get to be on different associations and organizations, we get a chance to work with nonprofits. We get a chance to work with, you know, um, law firms. So it, it's really a wide variety and that comes with some of those different jobs. I, I don't bill my hours. I actually am salaried. I, I carry a Crackberry 24 seven. Doesn't mean that I'm getting calls 24 seven, but there's a certain level of hierarchy that people are going to be calling certain people on staff. So. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, actually, it was my, I think, it, is it still around Gisto, the volunteer organization? I was actively really involved with them. Um, I was the direct co-director when I was a senior. Um, that really actually got me interested in volunteer management and nonprofits and learning about different social justice issues. And so that really led me into the nonprofit sector. And then I actually was a CA as well, a career assistant, and um, that has helped me a lot with resumes and supervising interns. Um, even knowing about internships, um, that kind of thing. Um, so for me, those two really probably were the most. And then doing my full-time internship, really. What for me, I did it my last semester here as a senior, and it really kind of helped transition me. I didn't take any classes, but I had to write a paper to get credit for it. Um, so I really was transitioning from being a college student to being in the real world because I was in a professional organization for my last semester. And I wasn't nearly as much a student anymore. And so for me, that was actually really helpful. And it helped with that transition. Oh, and the public speaking class I took was really helpful. Got to say, <laughs> I wish I would have taken management classes. <laughs> so, but public speaking is really good. You need to have that. I would say, um, for me, uh, the best thing that I, have for my career path from St. Ben's was just having, being being a St. Ben's graduate. I've had a lot of uh, people interview me based on the fact that I was a St. Ben's, St. John's graduate. And they've told me that flat out, that they went to St. John's or went to St. Ben's, and that's why they chose my resume over somebody else's. Um, and the other thing is, I think that it's something I started in high school, but that was also cultivated at St. Ben's was just research and study skills, just learning how to, you know, uh, properly sit down and study and uh, analyze uh, what you're reading and, and absorb it and um, apply it. And a lot of that goes into law school and, and taking the LSAT and in your law school classes, and I think that that's something that was cultivated here that I was able to apply when I decided to go back to school. I think for me, I'm going to take off on the public speaking. There was a public speaking course that was great, but I also did debate, and that puts you in a different limelight. Um, I also think that for me, we had J terms. I don't believe we do those here anymore. Um, that's where I did three internships. And then I also did a semester long internship at a law firm in St. Cloud. So it gives you that hands on experience. It also puts you in the working world um, in a certain in a certain position. And I think at that point in time, you can identify what your strengths are, what your development needs are. If you can't write and you rely on spell check and you don't know how to spell, that's interesting because we do see that. Um, if you, you know, if you're dealing with things that, you know, your communication, your, um, you know, your creative thinking, your strategic thinking, um, your ability to identify what are your strengths and what are your needs before you're going out, I think that's very helpful. I actually did a, st I did a stint in career services with Jackie Warner and Mary and Ed. I was one of their assistants years ago. And um, you get a chance to do aptitude tests. I mean, they're very, they're still very feasible. I mean, Franklin Covey, leadership qualities, we're on 2.0 now. And I think what's interesting, it's all very valid. And to be able to speak to that when you're doing an interview, have a good looking resume, have good looking references is you're right. I mean, we have a few Bennies that work for us. And it's funny because it's like, you find that out after the fact, it's like, oh, you went for St. Ben's, ah, you know, or this or that. And, you know, it, it's kind of that known that known comfort piece, I guess, but also it's neat to kind of know that you, you know what kind of education you came from. And I think that's what's interesting is it's that, that liberal arts piece as well, so. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
well, <laughs> not a criminal justice class, but. <laughs> Um, you know, there's a lot of different research on it. Um, the factors vary. Um, some of it is we know that kids who have been abused and neglected, especially early on, are at risk of getting in the system. Um, it's partly because of the trauma that they've suffered. We actually know that kids who've suffered early childhood trauma, their brain development is actually different, and so they react very differently than the rest of us who haven't had that experience. That's some of it. Um, our adult and juvenile systems have really become our de facto mental health system. So there's a lot of young people with mental health issues that are getting in, arrested for behaviors that are a direct result of their mental health. And because we don't have a really good mental health system, they're getting in. We've really, um, we've really criminalized young people nowadays. I mean, when I was in school, you just didn't get arrested for things you do now. <laughs> I mean, you just you went to your parent or the principal, but now they call the cops on kids if you have a fight. And let's face it, boys fight. That's what teenagers do. <laughs> I mean, and girls. Um, you know, teenagers, you do stupid things. It's part of your brain development, and so we're criminalizing it. So that's driving some of it is the way adults are treating young people. Um, we do know that kids in unstable neighborhoods tend to get involved. Um you know, I've heard stories from POs and judges where kids' parents are actually teaching them how to sell drugs and giving them themselves, giving the kids the drugs. So we have kids that are coming from not the best family situations that are contributing. I heard from my boss who did research on gang involvement here in Minnesota. The youngest age, the average age kids were joining gangs was eight, and there's a reason for that. I'm going to tell you this. So. Um, the age of 10 is when you can be adjudicated as a delinquent in Minnesota. That's the youngest age. Younger than 10, you get involved in child protection. So the adult gang leaders have learned that 8-year-olds can do things that the older kids or adults can't and not get in trouble. They're smart. What can I say? <laughs> um, so there's some of that. Um, we do have in Minnesota. We're one of the worst, but it's around the country. Kids of color, disproportionately arrested, involved in the system, and adults. Um, and so there are young African-American males are getting arrested for the same crimes as white kids in the suburbs, but they're getting a very different um, involvement in the system. That's driving it. Um, zero tolerance policies in schools. Um, kids aren't necessarily any more violent or any more criminal than they were before. Um, some of it really is our reactions. Um, Minnesota, actually across the country, arrest data is down. When I first started it, 55,000 kids were arrested in Minnesota. 2010, it was 38,000. So it's going down. But, you know, most of it, quite honestly, um, young people do stupid things because their brains are developing, and it's part of the development. If you look at arrest data, it starts going down after the mid 20s, and that's when brains are finally kind of developed. I mean, you look at the data, I'm sure most of your cases are people in their what, the early 20s? Yeah. Like, roughly speaking, usually, yeah, if I, well, I don't want so to profile, if, but yeah, yeah males, I, certain positions. But if you look at things. arrest data, it literally, mm -hmm. you can see it, it goes down. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if that really answers. And there isn't, there isn't really good, I'd like to say there's some really good reasons, but um, I just was at a training we did, and um, a gentleman from Ramsey County talked about most violent incidences last about 30 seconds. I mean, that's it. You know, even the incident that happened in Florida with that young man that was shot, I'm not going to give my opinion on that, but <laughs> I will say, though, if you think about that incident, 30 seconds at the most that that happened, um, you know, and so even people engage in really horrendous acts, and there are kids who do horrendous things, violent acts, they last a very small amount of time, um, and so, and we know that kids respond to treatments and interventions and even kids who are high risk who commit the most horrendous crimes we know do not necessarily continue into adulthood. So that's just not help. I'm sorry you got all those friends. I, I'm sure what I said probably helped contribute to it. <laughs> so yeah, so I I'm hoping that they didn't get charged with felonies. They're they're spirited if they do. <laughs> so, sorry. The average is a part of me. I, I will tell you, any of you when you do have kids, don't let them get in trouble. <laughs> it will haunt them for the rest of their life. <laughs> so, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, I actually, I'm contract, um, and so I work from my house, and so I have the benefit that I have two kids young. I'm home when they get up and get them on the bus, and I tend to be home when they get home, um, and that allows me that flexibility to be a working mom, but because I work from my home, I also end up working a lot of nights when they're in bed. Um, Quite honestly, I don't know anybody right now who does it well. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I mean, I talk to my girlfriends and working. What I find working parents, usually if there's two of you, one has to have a flexible job, whether it's working part-time or fewer hours so that you can make it work. And child care eats up a lot of your income, which is why I keep my kids at home and I use it sparingly. <laughs> And then they drive me nuts. But, um, like, my kids are in spring break right now, so I'm working while my kids are home. That's how I do it. But I wish I had a – I don't have a good answer. I don't know anybody. Do you guys? I don't have children. I, I mean, my kids are – they're four-legged, but um, I don't <laughs> – their kids do. One's in the car, a puppy. Um, I don't <laughs> – um, you know, it's, it's time management and you're right. You know, everyone has their own tricks of the trade. Um, you know, tonight in order for me to get here, the puppy had to come with, it's still a baby. <laughs> um, but you know, I also juggle a lot of different things. I'm salary. I have a flexible schedule, but caribou's big thing. The culture that's created at your place of employment is huge work lifestyle balance. If you are not happy at home, you're not going to be a happy camper at work. And so I have a girl that works for me, two kids, husband, um, recently unemployed, doing a lot of those things at home, but also, you know, she is hourly. And so she still needs to put in her time, but it's all about trying to manage that piece. Not everyone has that net, that niche or that ability. Um, I go at a very high octane level, but also I do certain things in certain ways. So if you budget your time out, budget what you can do and, you know, a lot of late nights. I mean, when I was in grad school, um, late nights, I mean, you're burning the midnight oil one, two in the morning and you're getting up at five or six. I mean, it seems common because that's college life too, or party hardy. But at the same point in time, when you're getting the working world, you're going to need your sleep. You're going to, you know, when do I work out? When do I do this? What about my friends? What about this? And you find time for it. It's just a matter of, it may be not as frequent. I would agree. It's definitely time management. Um, I have a three-year-old and I have a husband who travels um, pretty much Monday through Thursday for work. So we have a very detailed calendar that has who's doing uh, what you know, as far as pickups and drop-offs. And, uh, and it, it is, there are a lot of nights where I have to go to bed early because I want, I need to get to work early mm -hmm. in the morning so that I can leave at a reasonable hour um, in order to see her before she goes to bed and that type of thing. But um, it, it's manageable. It, I'm lucky enough to work at a firm where just about everybody has kids. And even though we all have our, you know, billable hour requirements and we all work hard, we all still ultimately are, are members of a family and have other things outside of work that are important to us. So um, you know, we all, you know, find time to exercise, find time to spend time with our kids and, you know, other outside interests. Um, but you do have to be kind of uh, detail oriented and organized in order to find time to do all of those things to get everything managed. Yeah. Or the other thing is you just live without cleaning your bathrooms on a regular <laughs> basis. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying you, what you do is you learn to, you learn to deal with things or leave things go that you maybe wouldn't before. Yeah, you compromise in certain ways. You're just kind of like, okay, I don't need the house picked up this weekend so I can spend time with my kids. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, you decide what's important and what's not. And you, learn to re you learn to reprioritize very quickly. Yep, mm -hmm. and, you know, you learn to clean your house when you have guests coming. <laughs> <laughs> so no <laughs> one goes to Cheryl's house <laughs> tonight. Just give me a warning. <laughs> well, I think one more resident is the like that. I'm going to take care of the child before, but does this mean that they're <laughs> Our benefits are very nice. Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, you can get coffee free all day long, 30% uh, off product, free beans, half pound every week. I know this is funny. I'm reciting the whole thing. And we have very competitive benefits. Um, but that's a huge thing, too. And I think that's a really good thing to point out is that when you're looking at a company, too, benefits are going to be big. Um, it's not all about the pay. I will tell you right now, I learned a huge lesson. I left a company for going to a place for more money, hated it, loved the job I had. So, you got to remember, too, what makes sense. 
you're not going to come out making the six, seven figures, okay? Um, maybe. <laughs> I mean, you probably have better luck playing the Powerball, and that's not a negative. It's just what's out there and what's realistic, and you have to love what you do. Um, then it's not going to feel like work. My dad always said, you live to work or work to live, and you think about that. You know, what, what do you want to do? What gets you excited? What's passionate? And you could be doing something for pennies, but gosh, you know, you live, you learn some of those experiences really early on, and uh, if you can find a happy medium, that's what's really helpful. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, we have any more say in the individual questions. Uh, certainly there's some that we can help. More than sit around for a few minutes and talk. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks folks. Thank you. Thank you.